director. <laughs> I'm off being a director for the year, but um, happy to be hosting this program. And um, I, I just uh, I always find this one of the most fun of, uh, events that we host um, because we get to hear from the amazing new faculty that we're hiring in the college. Um, and I'm appreciative of their willingness to share with us today um, something about their work in a way that um, we all can understand a little bit, even if we're not in their field. So just to recap, for those of you who haven't been part of this before, um, we always ask um, new faculty hired in the college um, to share their work in a non-discipline specific way so that um, those of us in other fields can, can know what they're doing. Um, and we've given them a pretty short time frame, five to seven minutes usually. Um, uh, we're not so pressed for time today, so I think we'll be, be lenient on that. But it, these are short presentations. Um, the, the data is there, I promise you, but there, if, you, if you want more, more specifics, you'll have to get back to them. Um, so I think without further ado, we're just going to begin and I'll, I'll just give you a, a very short intro to each of our speakers today and um, then we'll just turn to them. And uh, I think we will have time for a few minutes of Q&A after each of the speakers and then again at the end. All right. So let's get going. We've got Hania Barwi, uh, Assistant Professor, Modern Languages, Linguistics, and Intercultural Communication. And um, prior to UMBC, Dr. Barwi obtained a PhD in the Department of French Language and Literature at the University of Virginia. Her research interests include uh, Francophone bande dessinée, which is comics, for those of you who, who don't know that term, 20th and 21st century French literature and culture, Middle Eastern studies, transnationalism and cross-cultural exchange on the digital humanities. Wow. Okay. So welcome and um, the screen's yours. Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you so much for organizing this event and having me. Uh, today, I will be mainly talking about my book project, which is in still in progress, but let me share some slides with you. All right. My research focuses on the visual culture of the Francophone Middle East and North Africa. My book project primarily deals with the medium of comics and graphic novels created by women. So, in the past three decades, and especially after the 9-11 era, a new aesthetic emerged around representation of trauma and violence in graphic novels. Most of these graphic novels are intimate testimonial narratives that give marginalized voices a space to show the effects of individual and collective trauma. Authors like Will Eisner, Art Spiegelman, Joe Sacco, Alison Bechtel, Marjan Satrapi, and Lamia Ziadeh, to just name a few of them, have used the graphic novel medium to return to traumatic events and review them. In the context of the Middle East, after the success of Marjan Satrapi's graphic memoir, Persepolis, that retells her story growing up in Iran during the Islamic Revolution and her life as an immigrant in Europe, the medium of graphic novel became this new mode of expression to talk about uh, revolutions, wars, and sociopolitical instabilities, gender discrimination, and so on. I particularly studied the works of four authors Franco-Iranian Marjan Satrapi, Franco-Lebanese Zainab Abirashid, and Lamia Ziadeh, and Moroccan Zainab Fasiki. Similar to Satrapi, Ziadeh and Abirashid go back to their childhood to revive fragmented memories of the Lebanese Civil War that lasted for 15 years. They not only trace the violent past on the personal level, but also on the national level. Despite the long devastating war, Lebanon's political elites immediately erased the traces of the civil war 
right after the official end of the conflict in 1990. The Lebanese government generated an agreement called the Taif Agreement in order to forget the painful past, but discarding 15 years of war in a flash seemed impossible for a generation that experienced violence and constant political instability. So the Lebanese civil society started a war debate to challenge the saint ordained amnesia and evoke the memories of war. In the same vein, authors like Ziade and Abi Rashid retraced the war in their work and found the graphic novel medium to be useful to talk about the unspeakable. My book also argues how living in war zones and authoritarian contexts, as well as living in France, gave these authors a vision of culture that goes beyond the differences that divide humans. I also devoted a chapter to new emerging graphic novel writers from North Africa that use the medium to challenge gender politics, discriminations, and taboos. One of these writers is Zainab Fasiki, who questions the traditions and taboo around women, bodies, and women in general, but also on LGBTQ issues in her book, uh, Hishuma, which means shame in Moroccan dialect. I am interested in bringing the comics medium in the forefront of resistance to the political instabilities in the Middle East and the cliche about its women. Comics can personalize categories of people whose experiences are unseen and unheard in their societies and outside. For these writers, comics are a site of resistance. A site of resistance could be the battle of Iranian women against the compulsory veiling by letting a few strands of hair to be exposed, or the small acts of resistance of people in Zainab Rashid's building, for example, watering the flowers despite the water scarcity. My book shows how the Middle Eastern woman rebels against her imposed identities in the patriarchal society, as well as her stereotypical image as being voiceless and submissive. As a side project, I am working on the evolution made uh, by female directors uh, in the post-colonial Maghrebi cinema, directors such as Mariam Fuzani, or Mufida Talati, who try to depict women's struggle in traditional societies. All right. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for your attention. Thank and, you. And um, I'm more than happy to take questions if any of the folks have any questions. I see lots of clapping going on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, questions? Um, feel free to just, I think we're a small enough group to just unmute yourself and ask your question. So I have a quick question, uh, Jessica. Go for it. it. Uh, hi, Hania. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to hear about your research. I'm looking forward to that book. Uh, my, I'm a big fan of Marianne Satrapi's work, and I'm, I don't know the other authors, but I would love to hear more. And um, what I was interested in is, of course, graphic novels ha are a visual medium, right? So mm -hmm. I know that you're talking about the, the, the content, uh, the, the intellectual content and the political content, uh, but are you also going to try to, to um, talk about how the visual is being conveyed, um, you know, and, and analyze uh, uh, aspects of the visual aspects of these graphic novels in your research? Sure, that's a great question. Uh, so uh, visual analysis is a big part of my research. So uh, I try to back up all of these political issues and instabilities uh, using this visual analysis. That's what makes comics very special, actually, to talk about the unspeakable uh, violence of the past. So that would be a big part of it. 
Thank you. Thank you. I, I was going to ask the same question. I was very struck even just by that image in the that um, novel that you showed the last one where, where the, you know, clearly we have a, a, a woman in, in some sort of pain, but that that sort of very striking, not not the usual comic book kind of drawing um, and different kinds of materials. So, yeah, it will be super interesting. Uh, we are uh, having a humanities forum this semester. Um, with Hilary Shute, who is an expert on comics as well. So I hope, I hope um, those of you who've gotten intrigued will also come to the forum. Definitely. Anybody else? I have a quick question about how these texts circulate. I really enjoyed the taste of your research, but I'm curious, um, are these things that would be Mostly shared online, bought online. Could you walk into a bookstore? I'm curious in terms of the circulation aspect. Uh, so I guess uh, Persepolis and uh, Zena Abu Rashid's books uh, they have been translated in multiple languages, and they're easy to get them anywhere. Um, and especially uh, with Persepolis uh, being the pioneer. So, I guess other books that have been translated in English, uh, such as A Game for Swallows or I Remember Beirut, they are the kind of books that you can easily buy. And one semester I asked my students to get some of them and um, they got them from Amazon. So, it was pretty easy. But for Lamia Zia Day, I'm not that sure because those texts have been published in France. And there's only one book that has been pub, uh, published in English. So that would be a little bit tricky. Well, thank you again. Sure. Um, our next speaker is Lauren Clay, Associate Professor and Chair of Emergency Health Services. Um, and prior to UABC, Dr. Clay was an Associate Professor in the Department of Health Administration and Public Health at DeUville College in Buffalo, New York. Additionally, she was an early career research fellow with the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine Gulf Research Program from 2018 to 2020. Dr. Clay obtained a PhD in disaster science and management from the University of Delaware and a master's of public health from Drexel University. She was recently awarded an NSF career grant titled Career Bolstering Food System Resilience to reduce the human impacts of disasters. <clears throat> Dr. Clay's research interests include disaster management, public health, and disaster disruption to the local food environment and food insecurity. Welcome. Thanks. I was gonna say some of that. I guess I should have thought more about these intros. I'll skip that part. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, okay, perfect. Um, so I am Lauren Clay, and I am gonna talk with you today about my research on disasters and food security. Let's see, there we go. Um, you heard my background, so I do have a master's in public health and a PhD in disaster science and management. And I focus on public health impacts of disasters, um, looking at a broad range of, of health outcomes it, over the years, um, but my expertise really lies in food system disruption and food security from a wide range of hazard types. Um, theoretically, I, I um, understand the world using a socio-ecological approach or this idea that individuals live with um, households uh, in a social environment uh, with social systems and the built environment around them um, and governed by institutions and policies, all that influence health. Um, methodologically, I use um, some epi methods, geospatial approaches. I do a, a lot of qualitative and quantitative. Um, and uh, really, you know, you have to use different types of approaches when you're trying to understand individuals nested in complex systems. So that um, that's how I approach research. Um, I've lived in five states now. I'm new to Maryland uh, and four countries and uh, rural areas, urban areas. Um, uh, lower income and, and higher income areas. Um, and really that uh, set of experiences influences how I understand the world. Uh, I just study disasters, so it's not, um, you know, I haven't experienced every disaster that I study, 
uh, but it's really looking at um, across different disaster events and trying to understand commonalities that I, um, that's the perspective that I come from. So that's just important to keep in mind when I talk about my research. Um, those are some pictures of me living in different places um, and uh, in doing field work after different disasters. Um, so I look at food security, so I just thought it'd be good to share uh, what that means. So food insecurity is defined as a lack of consistent access to enough food for every person in a household to live an active, healthy life. And this can be temporary or it can last a long time. When we talk about food insecurity, we uh, use the terminology um, a, a person who is experiencing food insecurity. It is a, um, a, a, a dynamic uh, situation. Um, I began looking at food insecurity after Hurricane Katrina. Um, some of my early work looked at a cohort of families who had been displaced by Katrina and uh, what food insecurity looked like over the first five years. After finding that uh, food insecurity was much higher uh, in this population than the general population, you can see 21% of the cohort was food insecure three and a half years after Katrina, much higher than the 11% in the state of Louisiana at, uh, for the same time period. Um, I began looking at other disasters. So um, looking at Hurricane Harvey, found some uh, differences between urban and rural households um, and uh, worsened food insecurity for people who had to relocate. Um, and some of my collaborators found similar uh, findings in their studies of Hurricane Harvey. So it's in that context that um, I got some funding to look at food environment disruption and food security following Hurricane Florence in North Carolina in 2018. And in that, I really identified um, features of the emergency food response and challenges that people faced when navigating that post-disaster period. Um, so challenges with having transportation to get to emergency feeding locations or to food stores, um, challenges with competing priorities for time. So, you know, if you have uh, flooding in your home, you have a very limited amount of time, especially in a humid climate, to get everything out and to dry things before mold sets in. So you're not really thinking like, oh, let me take a two hour break, go find some food, come back and keep going in that context. There's also financial competing priorities. You know, if you lose all your food and everything else, um, it's a lot to try to navigate. And then there are major considerations about food storage and preparation limitations. So if you don't have a kitchen or a place to store and prepare food, the types of food that you can use are very different than uh, in a non-disaster setting. And so while we have lots of emergency food response, it's a challenging landscape to navigate. If you are able to get to a food store, there's also uh, availability challenges. So disruption to the supply chain, you might find empty shelves when you get to the store. Disruptions to demand, you know, maybe you're living somewhere different, you're shopping somewhere new, you've got people staying with you, you're buying different foods because your kitchen is damaged. Um, so it's difficult for stores to stock with all of those considerations changing day by day. Um, there's also differences by store types. You know, you might find one store, just looking here at the, the milk photos, uh, the photo on the left and the photo on the right were taken on the very same day. Um, and one has no milk and the other has plenty of milk. So there's variation by store type. And then also um, considerations with lack of appropriate food. So again, if you don't have a kitchen or a kitchen table or a place to prepare food, it's really hard to maybe find the foods that you need to be able to make your ends meet. So I'm doing this Hurricane Florence study, then COVID-19 sets in, and I'm sure you've all seen um, something on the news about food access, food insecurity, uh, lines for food pantries. Um, certainly as COVID started to unfold, I saw a lot of parallels of what was happening in the food system during uh, a public health emergency, different than the hurricane that I had been looking at. Um, but the same thing, you know, shelves were empty, supply chain disruptions, people were purchasing things differently because they wanted to maybe minimize time spent in the store or the number of trips. You had the same sort of storage food preparation consider considerations. You know, you might want to stockpile some food and stay home for a month. Do you have place for that? Maybe if you live in a small apartment or have a lot of household members. So a lot of parallels. Um, and even with, you know, all of the response that was happening, we saw food insecurity climbing in this country pretty rapidly. Um, so I partnered with some food banks um, to begin to understand food access and disparities among high risk groups. Um, and that is very much what we're doing currently. Um, we are looking in Connecticut, 
when we're looking in Massachusetts. Um, and we're part of a network of 15 states that are looking to understand how the COVID-19 pandemic has um, affected household food insecurity. Um, just one last note, I know I'm at time right now, um, but I also have a current grant that is really um, digging into how we measure food insecurity in this country. Uh, the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, does measure annually uh, food insecurity in the U.S. Um, and so we do know that there are a lot of disparities, um, but the USDA almost primarily measures um, uh, financial resources for food. As I just described, there are lots of non-financial barriers that people experience when disasters happen. And so I've got a USDA grant right now to develop some, um, some survey items specifically focused on non-financial barriers in a disaster. So I'm hoping to move the needle um, in how we're understanding food insecurity in our country. I'm happy to answer questions. Wow, such great work. It's so um, important. Thank you. Um, Floor is open for questions and again, just feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question because we're not a huge group. I'll, I'll ask a quick, quick question. Um, I'm curious, you know, just because you showed those pictures between the empty. Um, the, the supermarket with no no milk and the one with lots of milk. Um, if you if you get um, sort of into the weeds in terms of supply chain issues, and you know, are are you thinking about the you know the sort of various causes that that feed into that lack of access in certain places versus others? Yeah. So um, in that study, we we did um, grocery store assessments. Uh, we talked with individuals who were affected, and we talked with grocery store workers. Um, the, the explanation and that we're still analyzing all of that data. We've got a couple of papers out so far, but it's, uh, we have 4 waves of data, lots of different types. So it's, um, I'm still very much digesting and, and learning. Um, but as best as I can tell demand in that situation was what was driving the differences. So, um, imagine you lose the entire 1st floor of your home and you had a ranch. Right? So now you need cleaning supplies, you need food, you need uh, household items, um, maybe clothing, um, and you've got to take care of your family. There's only so many hours in a day. You're trying to do the work of, of preserving what you can from your household. You want to go to a store where you can get everything. Right? So the store on the left was a large store that has many sections beyond grocery, whereas the store on the right was grocery only. So, um, that was one driver. We also found, and and this is the case actually during COVID too, in my own personal experience, like I'll never go to a full service grocery store. If I need something that's in demand, I will always go to a corner store. Um, a smaller store will have better stock than a major store because you think, oh, someone's going to go get their preparedness supplies, right? They're going to go to the store where they can get everything and they can get a lot of it, right? I'm always going to, and and the prices are cheaper. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have the financial resources and the time to be able to go where I can get what I need and pay what I need to do it. Um, so there's a lot of equity issues in that, um, but that is what we're seeing from from that study and then just, um, you know, in, in COVID and, and the parallels. So interesting. So it's the demand side, not the supply side. That's interesting. I will say there are also supply chain issues, yeah. but. Um, but, you know, one of the best stores with the best um, disaster sort of plans that I know of is Walmart and the store on the left was Walmart. So um, there's a lot when you get into like regulation. So Walmart has great plans. They are very responsive, um, but there's also supply chain issues that are outside of a store's hands. So, for example, trucking. Um, so, so I've interviewed some um, truckers. I spent quite a bit of a time at, at the John Deere stores in various disaster communities. Um, so truckers cannot cross into a disaster declared county. So before Hurricane Florence, they needed generators and chainsaws and all these supplies to preposition that that the community was trying to get ready. And they would have to send an 18 wheeler from inside the county to the county line, offload a truck, reload a truck, drive in, drop off because a lot of the, there's there's rules about trucking and driving into disaster areas. So there's a lot in the supply chain side as well. Um, in this particular community though, I think the groceries were really driven by store type. Lauren, I had a question. Mm -hmm. Kind of bouncing off of uh, Jessica's question. 
Um, I know early in uh, the pandemic and shutdown of everything, I experienced the same thing in terms of trying to go to grocery stores. Um, one thing I discovered though was that um, once one grocery store that I didn't see the same problem was H Mart. So like international grocery stores and H Mart is considerably not a corner store. It's a it's an international supermarket chain. So are there any considerations for that in your study? Yeah, so I didn't have any, um, so, and I've never been to an H Mart, but I understand that um, it is, uh, what, and I, I won't even pretend to know the details of it, but it, it's for a particular, it's led by a particular ethnic group, right, driven by cuisine. Yeah, so that would be a specialty store. And even just in looking at food, the retail food environment literature, there are differences between uh, uh uh, what we call like a supermarket um, versus a specialty store. Um, so I would assume that there would be differences as well. There were none in the community I studied. I looked at 10 stores, two corner, uh, four locally owned and four national chains at four time points over the course of a year. So um, I, I can't speak directly to it, but from the literature, I would, I would imagine better stock in an H Mart than in a Walmart. Jason, last question. Amy had a question too. Oh, hey. I'm sorry. I, I think don't... Amy was first. I don't know. Go ahead, Amy. Oh, are you sure, Jason? Okay. I'll be really quick. Um, Lauren, welcome. Super excited um, to hear about your research. And I just wanted you to know that um, I would love it if we could do some some interdisciplinary work um, in the history department. We're interested in the history of disasters and and um, public health. I actually um, last semester we taught uh, our history capstone on the history of disasters. And um, the students were really interested in some of the continuities and, and some of the, the issues in response and, and preparedness over time. So I'm gonna be, uh, be uh, coming after you and asking if we could do something on that. Yeah, that sounds great. I actually met with someone in the history department who looks at food and the Civil War, which war is yes. a disaster. Dr. Rubin. Yes, yeah, exactly. And um, in the career grant that I mentioned, um, I have uh, historical case studies built in looking at past disasters and and food response. So um, definitely would be interested in engaging with students who might be interested in working on that or collaborate collaboration. That's wonderful. And Professor Forkelius, who's on this call too, is actually doing a food history uh, class right now. So we might have to connect you too. Thanks. Jason. I'll be quick. Uh, thanks, Lauren. This is wonderful, uh, fascinating research. And, um, you know, like everyone the last two years, it's much more top of mind. Um, uh, so it sounds like there's a lot that you've done around major systems of food uh, um, supply and demand, and then also a little bit about individual choices one can make within those constraints. Are, are you doing research or do you, are you aware of research about how communities have tried to become a little bit more um, resilient together in terms of distributing, um, sharing uh, food and other resources in, in periods of temporary or prolonged periods of, of shortages? I'm just, I'm just sort of curious. Yeah, um, so in my career grant, which will start at some point, um, the there is a piece of understanding um, how communities, you know, uh, mutual aid groups, things like that operate. I will also say that in the city of Baltimore, there is a food system planner that has created a resilience plan for Baltimore. Um, I have some collaborators at the Center for Livable Future at Hopkins who worked on that with them uh, over the past uh, several years, predated COVID even. Um, so, yes, that work is happening and I'd be happy to uh, to share a few things if you'd like to email me. Great, lots of connections here. Um, that's what I like. Well, we're going to move on and our next speaker is Emily Yoon Perez, who is um, an assistant professor in the English department. Um, prior to UMBC, Dr. Perez completed a postdoctoral fellowship for faculty diversity in the Department of English at UMBC. So she's one of our postdocs now, an assistant professor. Um, she obtained a PhD in English from the University of Maryland College Park. Dr. Paris's re research interests include multi-ethnic American literature, 20th and 21st century American literature, 
transnational American studies, comparative racialization, post-colonial literature and theory, and ethnic studies. Welcome. Thank you, Jessica. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, and for those of you who organized, um, I'm really appreciative of being invited to participate. Um, so I'm gonna focus today on my current uh, book project um, and I'm gonna try to share my slides here. Nope. asking me for my password, sorry. <laughs> Hold on, I'm trying to see if I can give you presenter privileges. Okay. Share. There's always some kind of issue like this, Emily, when it's face to face too. So we can't <laughs> edit. Um, it's saying I need to leave. And Courtney, do you think I could just email you my presentation? Yeah, we can do that. Okay, that might be easier. Sorry about that. All right, it's sent. Sorry, guys. <laughs> we we have time. No worries. Okay. Okay, I'm about to share my screen and I'm going to open it now. Great. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you. All right. So uh, my current book project is titled Little Intimacies, Race and Oceanic Migration and Minority U.S. Fiction. Um, and it pays particular attention to the small and the individual, which so often gets lost in large scale calls for social justice as a way of asking two central questions. Um, what happens when expansive systems of capital, racialization, labor, and empire not only reach outward across the globe, but also seep into the personal, the everyday, and the intimate? And how does literary studies allow us to explore this question through the little intimacies that arise between minoritized characters in the category of minority U.S. fiction broadly conceived? Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, Little Intimacies reimagines the category of multi-ethnic U.S. literature as a response to the, quote, transnational turn and the increasingly global concerns of racism and white supremacy. The field of multi-ethnic U.S. literature comes out of a historical moment when multiculturalism becomes a buzzword for addressing issues of representation in higher education. In the 21st century, higher education has seen a renewed demand for hiring and curriculum that reflects the experiences of racial and ethnic minorities and the current political landscape in a moment that has magnified the, persist the persisting legacies of systemic racism. Thinking historically about the relationship between these political movements and their reverberations on college campuses, I am interested in how we can reflect upon and shift our understanding of ethnic studies in the field of minority U.S. literature. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, my reading of U.S. authors who represent other countries, alongside global writers who represent the U.S., complicates our understandings of U.S. identity and racial formation, even as it clarifies my argument for a much-needed expansion of our definition of minority U.S. literature. I draw on a rich body of literary fiction that explores a broad range of global migrations, resulting from chattel slavery and indentured servitude, changing demands in global, uh, global labor markets, U.S. militarization and the expansion of empire to the post-1965 wave of immigration. I trouble the category of multi-ethnic U.S. literature to make a larger argument about the inclusion of literary texts that lie outside of the established canon. Specifically, I ask how rethinking what texts and authors belong in such a category provides a way of thinking about race that acknowledges the global reach of concerns about race, racialization, white supremacy, and colonialism as illustrated by the now global Black Lives Matter movement. Next slide, please. 
I use the term little intimacies to magnify the small in scale as a critical optic to understand the relationship between racial formations and migrations. I define little intimacies in three ways. First, as occurring through forced proximity, not just in terms of the distance between two people, but also the spatial realities that create proximity. This is especially pertinent in my first chapter where the novels focus on indentured servants being transported across the, aboard the confined space of ships during the 19th century. Second, I consider the cursory, which is easily overlooked because of its transience and even anonymity. Both Chang, Re, Chang Rei Li's The Surrendered, for example, and Jimbo Lihiri's The Lowland, which are both novels, feature marriages of convenience between virtual strangers, resulting in a temporary intimacy that helps these characters survive difficult circumstances that are intensified by their marginalized identities. Though these relationships are not built on traditional romantic love, there results a different kind of intimacy that ultimately leads to alternative forms of kinship beyond the heteronormative nuclear family. Finally, little intimacies are the moments leading up to and in the aftermath of unex unexpected affiliations. In particular, I'm interested in the uncomfortable encounters that lead to surprising intimacies and the ramifications of those intimate relationships beyond solidarity and kinship. In a number of texts in my project, intimacy and an, in an initial sense of interracial solidarity actually leads to betrayal. Zachary Reed, for example, in the Ibis trilogy is the son of an American enslaved woman who emerges as a high ranking operative of the East India Company by the end of the trilogy. His uncomfortable transformation eradicates the possibility of racial solidarity that concludes the first installment by the end of the trilogy. My project responds to and builds on critical work that amplifies the regulation of intimacy as integral to colonial projects. In magnifying the attachments between characters, my four body chapters traverse the Indian, Pacific, and Atlantic Oceans, widening the scope of Paul Gilroy's important claim that the Black Atlantic is both a transnational center of Black diaspora culture and a mode of study that crucially links the experiences of the Black diaspora to a historical process of modernity. I also trace what Lisa Lowe calls the intimacies of four continents, the overlapping histories, routes, and economies that contributed to an ongoing project of liberal democracy and freedom that was necessitated upon a global system of empire. My readings map the physical routes of characters not only to represent those movements, but also to show how travel provides opportunities for cross-racial solidarities. Significantly, I also discuss instances when such affinities fail, raising uncomfortable questions about what remains when inter and intra-racial solidarity ends or becomes impossible. And I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you for that. So interesting. This is why I love this set, these meetings, right? Um, all right. Who's got a question for Emily? Yeah, Jason. Oh, sorry. Someone other than Jason? Jean. Jean. Um, why don't you start since Jason's asked and he can go second. Jean? I thought you wanted Jason to go first. No, go. you go ahead. All right. No, no, I was just interested in, uh, Emily, your reference to national and global formations of race. And I was wondering if you could expand a little bit about the concept of national formations of race. Uh, are you looking at national formations of race, not only from the US, but also the way formations of race, race are nationally determined in these other countries as well, in South Asia or elsewhere, and the way these you know, contending national discourses of race are also operating uh, for people who are constrained to little intimacies? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, so this project is com coming out of this question of um, how we understand race in this category that we call multi-ethnic U.S. literature. And one thing that I just kind of noticed was um, that so much of the conversation was based on how race is experienced in the U.S., which is, of course, important. But I was noticing in all these texts that I was reading through graduate school that um, you know, a lot of these characters who kind of start in the US and have a certain idea of what race means um, when they're within the bounds of the nation, um, once they kind of interact with these um, global characters um, that 
completely um, at times transforms how they understand not only how racialization works um, in a global context, but how that changes how they understand their own relationship to national understandings of race and their own personal racial identity. Um, so that example I used of Zachary, I think is a really good one because he comes um, from Baltimore um, and gets aboard the ship and encounters all of these different um, kinds of people of different classes and ethnic and racial backgrounds. Um, and at first that kind of leads him to think about himself um, as part of this larger minority coalition. Um, but then he also realizes that without the sort of constraints of how race is understood in the US, that actually gives him an opening to um, expand um, how he could be understood um, for his racial identity, for his own personal advancement. Um, so, you know, I find that really interesting, just like the collision of different ways of understanding race and then how that allows these characters to um, make certain decisions about how they can present themselves for different reasons. That's Amitav Ghosh's Ibis trilogy that she's talking about, just filling in the title, if you don't know it. Um, Jason. Um, yeah, thank you so much. This is a, such a fascinating uh, project and I'm really interested in it. I used to teach a class in American studies called Multicultural America and um, I, I wasn't able to articulate or conceptualize what was wrong, <laughs> but I feel like your project is uh, is, is really uh, helping me retroactively understand <laughs> what was wrong with the whole idea and the concept. Um, more about that uh, some other time. I just quickly wanted to know, mine is not a very sophisticated question. What are some of the other texts you're looking at? Yeah, so um, the first chapter is looking at Ghosh's trilogy and Christina uh, Garcia's monkey hunting. Um, second chapter looks at Chang Ray Lee's um, The Surrendered and Toni Morrison's Home, along with James Baldwin's Just Above My Head. Third chapter is, can I get this right? Uh, Monique Trong's The Book of Salt um, and The Sympathizer Trilogy by Viet Thanh Nguyen. And then the final chapter right now, I'm thinking about the Jimbo Lahiri novel, um, The Lowland, along with um, Christina Garcia's Monkey Hunting again, but with a different character. Not a small project. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? I have a quick question, Jessica. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Emily. This was so interesting. Uh, I'm all like, um, you know, I'm really excited to know more. I mean, to read your book, just like what I said to Hani. Uh, what I was interested, uh, very intrigued by was when you said that you were a, you were going to try to map the physical routes of the characters. I was just wondering how that would play out in your uh, narrative of your book. Yeah, that's a great question. So each of my chapters, I group those texts together um, thematically, but also just based on how the authors narrate those migrations. So the first chapter, um, all the migrations are very clearly laid out in um, extensive detail. The second chapter, we get zero narrative of these migrations. So we, um, you know, one chapter ends and then the next chapter opens with the characters in a completely different place and we don't know what happened. Um, the third chapter, the narrators are unreliable, so it kind of forces the reader to speculate. So I'm going to try to do a little bit of um, not just trying to figure out where these characters are going, but um, what that kind of means that that access to their movement is obstructed for the reader. And then the final chapter is actually looking at um, female characters who cannot travel um, and what that means when they sort of use their imagination to um, stand in for their ability to move. Wow, that's so fascinating. <laughs> Something I've never heard of before. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Keegan, if it's okay with you, can you hold your question? I, wa I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for our last speaker. Yeah, okay. Um, our, our last speaker is Yolanda Valencia, who is Assistant Professor of Geography and Environmental Systems. Um, and prior to UMBC, Dr. Valencia obtained a PhD in geography from the University of Washington. Dr. Valencia's research interests include geographies of displacement, border imperialism, racial capitalism, and transborder feminist methods and theory. Welcome. I don't know if you're um, speaking, but I, you may be muted.
I want I wanted to be proactive by sharing my slides already and everything because I know that we're running out of time. So uh, let me see. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can okay. hear you and please take your time. Thank you. Uh, let's see, slide show. All right. So I want to start by, of course, thanking the organizers, Courtney Hobson, the Dresher Center for us are the Arts and Humanity for hosting these events and for inviting me. Um, I have actually prepared quite a long presentation, but I'm going to be mindful of time. If um, uh, Let me see. I'm actually going to go ahead and start my timer because I really want to stay on time. So um, my work is qualitative and I usually go into so much detail. So maybe that's the case in this case too. But I'm starting to think about a book project. It's, it's a very niche, in a very initial sort of ideas. And um, the, the title, the potential title of this book, or what I'm going to be focusing on is, is on relational life and what I'm calling legal debt. And I'm going to do my best to explain, you know, where this comes from. Um, so uh, basically my work looks and focuses on um, on both on geographies of oppression and also on thriving geographies. Uh, to do so, my work, my work looks into how people who have been displaced from a specific rural community in Mexico experience state-led violence in multiple spaces across the migration journey. And in their in that, what I'm calling migration journey is their community, um, the what we call US-Mexico border, and also in the US. But most importantly, I look at to, into methods of creating meaningful and humane life that these communities practice across these different places. So my work look at, looks at how these methods uh, of thriving travel across the space and how such methods are adapted and readapted to confront ongoing and new barriers. So I am going to uh, start by telling you a story. I like to tell stories that will reveal a paradox into how and why my research topic emerged and how my topic is actually guided by my own immigrant community. This paradox that I'm going to reveal is entangled in the politics of the city where my work takes place, that is Pasco, Washington. Um, located east of Washington, Pasco is one of the trans cities. The other two are Kennewick and Richland. Pasco was the first of the tri cities to be built, and its economy is mainly agricultural driven. Really, let me, let me close my door. My, my dog is barking. I'm sorry. One second. I'm sorry. There is somebody delivering something, so my dog is barking. So um, currently over 60% of the population that in Pasco identifies as Latinx, mostly Mexicans, and the city maintains the conditions for their ongoing exploitation of, the la of their labor by enacting police violence, criminalization, and constant intimidation of Mexican immigrants. And as such, my work found that Pasco is not a city where uh, Mexican immigrants are supposed to thrive or even survive. And I'm gonna provide just a few examples to illustrate how this takes place in Pasco, starting with police violence and racial criminalization. This image that you see is of a Mexican immigrant who was shot 17 times by the Pasco police in 2015. He was killed because he was throwing rocks at some of the cars, some cars in a parking lot in a grocery store, and someone called the police on him. Um, this is a quote from Mayor Watkins, who I interviewed, and even though I didn't ask about the Zambrano case, he kept bringing it up, highlighting the idea that Zambrano was illegal in this country, and thus implying that he was a criminal whose life had no value. And of course, there were no charges for this crime either. Um, there is also intimidation, surveillance, and active deportation, and this is a quote by uh, by the uh, chief of the police, Bob Mesker in Pasco, who explained to me that Pasco is not a sanctuary city and that actually uh, the police collaborates with ICE uh, for deportations. Also, the police was criticized for taking uh, lessons, Spanish lessons from the Border Patrol, which of course also inhibits intimidation for the, for the community there. 
However, given all this evidence that I just provided, and also there's so much theory, amazing theory about state-sponsored violence, and also during that time Trump was elected, I was surprised to find during my interviews that most of my immigrant participants actually referred to the U.S. as a place that provides security, and also to Pasco as a place of tranquility and peace. As such, my research question shifted from just focusing on violence, but actually to trying to understand how is it that undocumented Mexican immigrants construct intimate politics of thriving and tranquility in places aims state-sponsored violence. So uh, my method uh, to my research is qualitative. I draw on interviews, ethnography, and testimonials. I collected over 40 testimonials, the majority from undocumented immigrants. I also interview eight city leaders, including the ones listed here. And as a lifelong ethnographer um, in, in part of the Mexican community, I also draw on ethnography and out, ongoing autoethnography as an indigenous and Chicana feminist decolonizing methodology. So my work also engages with this idea of social death. According to Lisa Maricacho, she says that um, the, the immigration law produces a permanent criminal status and that those who are targeted and criminalized by the immigration law become ineligible for personhood. And thus she says this is a form of social death. In other words, she says that the immigration law has the power to take away humanity and force people into a status of social death. However, from my in-depth and relational research in my community, I am refining that concept to think not about social death because communities I work with have created social networks and relations of thriving, of solidarity in community, of personhood and humanity, or what I call social life. And as such, I argue that personhood and humanity are not determined by the law. And he here I am drawing on indigenous scholars who indicate that all knowledge are relational. I am also drawing on black scholars who demonstrate that the oppressed is producing and experiencing other kinds of humanity in space. So instead, I'm refining social death to mean legal death. Uh, my work demonstrates that legal death is a layer of status produced by the state through the immigration law, and that legal death is relevant only in relation to the state. So while the law does produce tremendous barriers and material consequences on targeted populations, I argue that the law does not dictate all aspects of humanity and life. And as such, the law cannot fully give or take away humanity, personhood, or social life. Social life, oops, I know I'm out of time, so I'm, I'm gonna stop soon. Um, so social life um, are given and produced by your everyday relations with the people around us, with our community, both near and at distance. And here is one of my main arguments is that when it comes to Mexican immigrants, we cannot understand how they are able to make thriving lives in the US without understanding their experiences of oppression and struggles in Mexico, because methods and knowledge of producing thriving lives travel. The reason is that the state violence affects the same population across national borders, and in turn, these populations adapt and readapt practices and policies of thriving across the space. So my work is transnational and transborder, and it excavates how suffering is produced and what politics of thriving emerge both in Mexico and in the US. So I have much more already pre uh, prepared here to show why this matters and why the fact that my community at least the one that I'm talking about, which is very specific, comes from an agrarian place where they actually continue to practice what um, uh, Martinez Luna, who is an indigenous scholar, Zapotec indigenous scholar, calls commonality because they share everything, work, the land, and fiestas is by and for the community. And it is that community, my community in Pasco, most of them migrating, migrated from an agrarian community that actually practices commun um, communality too. So I'm gonna stop now and I'm open to, um, to questions now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yolanda. Um, such interesting work and, and, and there's so many overlaps and connections among all the, these scholars. It's amazing. Uh, questions. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen just so then I can see more of the. Um, All right, I'm going to stop. That would be great. Thanks.
stop sharing. Okay, perfect. Um, Maggie, does someone have a question? I thought I saw one. Uh, uh, Jessica, I don't have a question, but just to say to your Yolanda, that uh, Yolanda, this is Praminda, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for this like um, fascinating glimpse into your research. Um, I, you know, I'm so excited because of, uh, next year uh, well, the CARS Research Centers are organizing something called a CARS Colloquium Series, and the theme that has been selected is resilience. And I think you would make a fabulous <laughs> speaker for that uh, that topic because of the way you are approaching the subject. So thank you, and I'll let others. Thank you, Praminda. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Um, I am really fascinated by your work and the um, some of the theorists that you're working with. I'm curious just about your methods. You mentioned interviews. Are you mostly doing um, ethnography and is it mostly sort of um, personal accounts or will you talk a little bit about how you're you're studying some of this, um, you know, sense of social life or, or commonality, um, um, you know, what sort of techniques you're using to examine it? Thank you so much for asking this, Keegan. And as I say, it's mixed. But I actually collected over 40 testimonials from uh, my community, mostly from undocumented immigrants. Um, and I know that the way that I frame my questions influence, of course, how they respond to them. But when I ask them, well, what, how do you navigate PASCO? What PASCO means to you? And when they responded that it was a good place to raise kids, that it was a place of family, of tranquility, that really threw me off. And I'm like, wait a second, am I not looking into the right place? But yes, I'm trying on, on testimonials. It's been quite a long journey um, and I'm in constant um, communication and I go there, you know, I, again, that is like my second home is in, in Washington State. And, um, and my first home is in, in El Rancho, this place I call El Rancho, the agrarian community. So I also go there as often as I can. And I'm creating a third home here in Maryland too. So I have multiple homes, but all of this to say that, yes, I include um, interviews and I call them testimonials. Thank you, Keegan. I also, I, I love that. Um that moment that you just talked about, about, you know, hearing from your research subjects, uh, so, a different story than what you were expecting and letting the stories um, guide your renewed question, which, um, you know, it, 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 we've all been there, but, you know, to be that open to it and um, to, to let that thriving emerge where you thought you were going to hear stories of social death is really compelling um, just in, in terms of research method. Um, but I also, um, I know we all have kind of been surprised about the networks of thriving that have emerged or, or reemerged during the pandemic. So, um, it also rings a bell for a lot, for lots of us who, um, you know, are figuring out ways to get around empty, empty supermarket shelves or, or whatever other impediments out there. Of um, course, yes, that, that actually played a big role during the pandemic and continues to do. People are being very supportive to each other. You know, whenever somebody gets sick, they bring food to each other and they organize in that way. Well, and I know um, in, in Washington, D.C., there's been a much more formalized attention to um, sort of cooperative ne networks of self-care or self-support in various neighborhoods. Um, I'm sure that's true in Baltimore too, that all of a sudden this is now something we, we pay much more attention to. So I think it, mm -hmm. it um, has ramifications quite broadly. Yeah. Um, we're just about at time. Anybody have a last question? Well, if not, then, um, I, yeah, J Jason's saying such amazing presentations always, but, you know, especially just amazing presentations. Thank you for doing this, even under current conditions. Um, it's always energizing and there's so many in intersections here. So it just makes me very excited. Thank you all. And thanks for coming. For, for making this happen and for providing the space for us to like uh, learn about each other's work and hopefully find ways to collaborate.
Hats yes. off to Courtney for getting it going. Yes. Thank you, Courtney. <laughs> Thank you all.